Thank you very much. No, actually, it's me who asked. Thank you, because of course, this is a great opportunity to uh, get to know your neighbors, to, to know what people are doing around campus, and also to tell a little bit about what I'm doing. Uh, if anybody is then interested, of course, much better. Uh, I, I'm, I'm already apologized with Anne Florence because she heard most of it last week. Um, so what I'm, I would like to, to tell you today is uh, uh, a little bit something that I started doing about eight years ago, when uh, a host of techniques to understand, uh, I would like to really to say understand the makeup of protein sequences uh, came about, uh, which in the end gave rise to AlphaFold, the algorithm that everybody is talking about for protein structure prediction. But actually, what I'm going to uh, lead through lead you through to, uh, today is more like uh, what came before and why uh, what was there came before uh, AlphaFold. And then, uh, as, a, as you see in the subtitle, I will use this uh, HSP70 chaperone system, which is a little bit my pet protein, uh, as an example of what you can do uh, using these tools. So, uh, first of all, uh, I don't expect necessarily uh, for people to know what proteins are. First of all, acknowledgement, since I already, I always know that I tend to be fast at the end. I don't want to miss the opportunity to thank the people who really do, did the heavy work uh, on with me. So Duccio was a PhD student of mine, now is a research scientist at St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital in Memphis. Alessandro was an ambitious postdoc at the time, and now is a PI at the Centre de Biologie Structurelle uh, of uh, Montpellier. And Stefano Zamuner who was a uh, postdoc with me and now he, he is working in a startup here at PFL. And uh, as I said, uh, what are proteins? First of all, let me let let discuss what proteins are. And uh, um, you know about genes uh, and genes in DNA encode for molecular entities. Most of the times they encode for proteins. Sorry, I'm trying to press the correct button. They are encoding for proteins. So every gene, let's say, not really every gene, but most genes will encode for proteins. And the sequence of bases in DNA will be translated through a series of processes, uh, translation, um, transcription first and translation afterwards, into proteins. Last stage happens on the ribosome. And a protein is just a chain of smaller units called amino acids that come in, in 20 different flavors. And uh, this I mean, a chain of amino acids emerges once the protein is synthesized in the cell by the ribosome, emerges as a polymer. That as it emerges, or so just after it comes out, uh, out of the ribosome, uh, will fold, and that's the correct fork term, into a precise three dimensional shape. And this is important because this three dimensional shape is what carries out the function of the, the protein, because it will expose on the surface of the protein the correct chemistry and physics that will lead to interactions, to uh, enzymatic reactions, and so on. So really, the three-dimensional shape of the protein is crucial for its function. And given that, essentially, it has a totality of uh, functions inside the a cell are carried out by proteins, it is extremely important that proteins find their correct three-dimensional shape. Now, in uh, uh, back in uh, around 59 and 61, in uh, essentially three papers, Amfinsen showed that actually this process of protein folding is autonomous. What I mean by autonomous is that it doesn't need anything else uh, to, to happen. It took proteins, it purified them, so there was nothing else than these proteins. It put them in a test tube, and he saw that they could fold without any external assistance. If you think in terms of physics, this means that the native state, how the, how the functional state of a protein is called, must be the minimum of some energy function. Now, of course, this was a very important breakthrough, and Amfinsen went on to uh, win the Nobel Prize uh, uh, in uh, 73 for this discovery. But essentially what it tells us, and this is the core message, is that if given that the protein can fold in isolation, it's just the sequence of amino acids, that is, the genetic sequence that was in base, in base pairs, has been translated into a sequence of amino acids. The knowledge of this sequence of amino acids is enough, contains all the uh, instructions that are enough for the proteins to spontaneously, autonomously reach the native state. And this was a major breakthrough because it immediately gave the hope that there could be theoretical methods to 
if you want a sort of a function that takes the sequence and gives an, out, an output, the structure. There has to be. In a way, we know that conceptually there has to be such a function that takes the sequence and provides the function. And the very first attempts were actually based on, uh, I'm a physicist, so I will, I will say on stupid physics, in the sense that if you know all the forces between the amino acids, between the atoms of the protein, of the solvent and everything, then you just follow Newton's law until you find the minimum of the, of, of the energy. And this is absolutely correct as an idea. The problem is that the number of degrees of freedom and the precision that you should have during the, the integration time steps and the knowledge of all these forces should be so precise that after 60 years, this approach has had some success, but very limited for small proteins that are fast at folding. Um, of course, through this approach, we have learned a lot about the physics of protein folding. So really, uh, our understanding of the physics of protein folding has benefited from this approach. But if the goal was to go from sequence, amino acid sequence, to structure, I would say that this has been a little bit of a disappointment. Uh, although people are still working on it, because as I said, you can learn still a lot of, a lot of interesting things. But uh, where is it that things uh, become more interesting? Is that actually the uh, relation between the sequence and the structure is pretty peculiar. Now, think about the diversity of uh, life on Earth. Uh, we have, just thinking about vertebrates, we have sperm whale, humans, uh, lizards, birds, amphibians, and, and whatnot. All of them have, for example, hemoglobin. But hemoglobin will be different because of mutations. The, the, the phenotypic, the shape difference that we observe is the result of genetic differences, which means also protein differences. The sequence, because of mutations, has changed from one organism to the other. And yet, in those cases where we have enough uh, structures, from, for the same protein from different organs, we see that the structure is almost identical. Which means that although Hamfinson has told us that the sequence contains the information to fold the protein, this information in a way can be written in many different ways. There are many different sequences that contain the same instructions to reach the same, exactly the same functional native state. Uh, and so this uh, led to the question whether by observing these mutations and the pattern of mutations, we could get the rules that dictate the folding. And uh, in order to understand, uh, for example, and this will be, this is actually the most important concept uh, to, to retain possibly <laughs> about uh, all of this talk, although it's not necessarily biologically correct, but is fully correct, but it's not completely wrong either. Uh, now, this is a protein and has its three-dimensional shape, which is stable, which means, as we say, that has the, minim the minimum of the energy. Now, let's say that the blue amino acid is positively charged and the red amino acid is negatively charged. Now, they are close together. They have a good uh, electrostatic interaction that will stabilize the protein. Now, let's say that by a mutation, this amino acid, the blue one, reverses its charge. Now, we will have two like charges, they will repel each other, the protein will be less stable and maybe a little bit less optimal. Of course, if it is completely unstable, the organism dies. But let's say that it's, a, uh, it's okay as a mutation, it's not optimal. But the organisms that we will observe after some time are the ones that are optimal. Again, the other ones in time will be uh, ruled out by, by selection, which means that possibly also now the red amino acid will have reversed its charge too. So to reconstitute the good positive-negative interaction. Which means that if these two, two amino acids that are far apart on the sequence, the sequence try to follow the ribbon as a rope, and you see that they are not contiguous on the, on the, on the protein, but they are close to each other in the three-dimensional shape. When you, you need to preserve the stability of the protein, you would expect that protein, uh, amino acids that are close by in space should have correlated mutations. And that was precisely the idea that came about uh, about 30 years ago uh, in a very seminal paper. They said, okay, let's look at this, uh, precisely at these correlations. So sometimes you really have, like in this yellow column, 
you just have histidine. So it's perfectly conserved. For some reason, this position cannot mutate. But in other cases, this is the same pro in alignment. These are called multiple sequence alignment. It's the same protein from different organisms. Actually, I put also dinosaurs because now, because of various techniques, we have a few proteins even from dinosaurs, like collagen and so on. So that's uh, not main, of course. Um, but in other cases, you might have variations in one column and variations in another column. Now, just intuitively think about this. If you can take the frequency of a given amino acid in a given position, let's say column amino acid N in column whatever it is, J, uh, and then amino acid A in column I, you have the two frequencies, that is the two probabilities. Then you look at the probability, the joint probability of having N in column J when N I A in column I. If the product of the independent probabilities is significantly different from the joint probability, it means that you have a correlation. And so on this basis, of course, it was translated into uh, an algorithm in this paper, but doesn't matter. In this case, when you detect such pairs, now this is a good way because to detect these correlations. And imagine that you want to fold the rope. And you know now that this position is correlated to this other position. I don't know if you can see my hands uh, on, the, on the screen. And, that, and then you should join them because they are correlated. And then you have another pair and you start joining them. At some point, if you have enough of these pairs, there is only one and one way to fold a rope to satisfy all these constraints. And so essentially, you will be able to fold the protein just based on this idea. Now, the first problem, okay, let me skip this. The first problem was uh, essentially in the number of uh, sequences that people had in 1993, if I'm not mistaken, 1992, 1993. So essentially, there were like 100, at most about 100 proteins for every protein family that they looked at. And if you think that you have the, the, to characterize the correlations between pairs, specific pairs of amino acids in all, all possible pairs of positions, you have the square order of square of the length of the protein times 400, because you have 20 amino acids in each position. So if you have to have a correct statistical, statistically significant, let's say, uh, evaluation of these correlations, you need a lot of sequences to do so. Now, actually, this is not really the case, but for the way we understand it now. It was clear at the time that you would have needed uh, a lot of sequences, and these were far from enough. And the second problem was, and actually, this problem has been solved by modern sequencing techniques. Now, this is the number of sequences that you have in Uniprot, which is the largest repertoire of protein sequences that we have, it's exponentially increasing. And now we are beyond 200 millions. And actually, adding some other techniques, we are around a billion uh, sequences. And uh, it, it, it multiplies by 10 every seven, eight years. So the problem of how many sequences we have is essentially in the past, is in the rear mirror. We have enough sequences to do most of what we need for most proteins. Of course, for some proteins, we don't. but for most, yes. Uh, and there is actually another problem, which is also crucial, is the fact that now J is closing space in this mock structure to both K and I. So there will be correlations between I and J and J and K. But because there are corre these correlations, there will be also correlations between I and K. And now, if you start trying to enforce also the, proxi the three dimensional proximity of I and K, you are doing it wrong because they are not closing space but they are just closing space to, to an intermediate. And actually, uh, this is a problem that was the major hurdle, even with more statistics. And uh, actually, this is where uh, physicists came into the game uh, around to, uh, to 2009. And they proposed a method, which is called direct coupling analysis. That was the first one that actually there were several methods prior to that trying to solve this problem. None of them was successful. This method was really the first one that was successful. And actually, the first instance of AlphaFold was based on this method. Uh, and the idea is pretty simple. There is, and I will skip uh, on the ways you reach this expression, but it is that there is uh, a probability distribution for the sequences. X, here is the sequence. 
So for every sequence, there is a statistical weight that is associated to the sequence. So for every amino acid that you have in every position, X, I, X, J, and that actually will depend on some parameters that will tell how likely, essentially will weight how likely it is to have a certain amino acid in position I, or a certain pair of amino acids in position IJ. And so you will have parameters HI and JIJ. And uh, the rule of the game here is just to find the parameters HI and JIJ that best reproduce the statistical properties of the data set of real proteins. So you can say either that you fix the correlations and you will find and the conservations and you find HI and JIJ that satisfies those equations. Essentially, it's a maximum likely principle where you try to maximize the probability of the observation by finding the co-parameters that indeed maximize this probability. These are technicalities. The most important point is that you have this JIJ, and this JIJ tells you how strongly, through evolution, these two amino acids in that position, in those two positions, were crucial to each other. And so the, the largest, the value of this JIJ, the most likely it is that these two amino acids were close in space because they have influenced each other's evolution. Now, these are, again, technical aspects that we can uh, skip. But we can, so essentially the workflow is you take the multiple sequence alignment, you do this, uh, if you want, maximum likelihood process, you get this JIJ, and then you try to see whether the contact map that you predict, in this case, the prediction of the contact map, just plotting the largest JIJs, uh, in, in our case is the blue, sorry, the blue one, corresponds to the contact map of the protein in the case, for example, here is, a, of course, a benchmark. We know the structure. So here, every red dot is when there is a contact in the, in the known structure. Here are the predicted contacts. And as you see, they are almost perfect. Uh, again, there were a lot of successes, but let me show now how uh, these successes of this technique that, as I said, was the precursor for the first instance of AlphaFold, uh, uh, how it attracted us uh, together with this protein, with the, which is called HSP70. Now, HSP70 stands for heat shock protein. 70, which is 70 amino uh, kilodaltons, each shock protein, because it's a protein that is expressed under stress. And indeed, the major function, although it has many other functions, but let's say the major, major function across all organisms is uh, to protect the cell against stresses. Uh, actually, it helps protein fold correctly, which is kind of ironic because Anfinson told us that proteins can fold by themselves. He won the Nobel Prize in 73. In 73, each of proteins were discovered to be essential for proteins to fold correctly in the cell under stress. So yeah, it's a sort of a mix of history, but the, what Anfinson told remains true. So it performs really, really a vast array of functions. Overall, you can just keep on, uh, bring home the idea that it helps other proteins go through conformational changes, among which also protein folding. And what is interesting is that it does so by going through a specific conformational cycle through which it can bind to its substrate and induce its conformational changes. And going from the conformation which is bound to ATP to ADP, in doing so, it burns energy, consumes energy, which it transforms into work that is performed on its substrate. But already pictorially here, you see that there are two different conformations of HSP70. And these two conformations that are different here in a cartoonish way are essential for the function. And so the question that we asked at the time, together with Duce and Alessandro, was, okay, given the fact that direct coupling analysis, so coevolution, is telling us about the structure of proteins, and here we have two vastly different structures that are both crucial to function, evolution should have preserved them. So is it true? Let's see what direct coupling analysis says. And by the way, this is a 600 amino acids protein. So it was one of the largest ever uh, seen by the time uh, by, coevolution, uh, by coevolutionary techniques. And this was the, uh, the result. OK, let's look at the ATP bound conformation, which is or was already known. So now here is a slightly different representation of the contact map. 
In black are the crystal contacts. Whenever two amino acids are closer than eight angstroms, there is a black dot. So here, this is a contact map. And the predictions are either green when they correspond to a, a, a real contact or red when they do not correspond to a real contact. And as you see, most predictions are correct. And here we have that this bunch of predictions and contacts correspond to the contacts between these domains, because HSP70, as you saw in the cartoonish representation before, is made by different blobs. The green, the red blob is where ATP is bound, and the green and blue blobs are the blobs that will bind the substrate. And when it is bound to ATP, they are docked on the uh, red domain through these contacts that we predicted. But we don't predict, but we don't understand what these contacts are. But then we can go to the ADP bound conformation when, oops, sorry, when now upon ATP hydrolysis, so now here there is ADP, the, these, two, the, these two parts detach from the red domain and bind to each other. And suddenly we reconstruct these contacts. Of course, we lose these ones because now they are not docked here anymore. So both conformations, although vastly different, are contemporary, uh, at the same, simultaneously uh, written in the sequence of HSP 70s. So coevolution really even sees multiple sequences. Now we can say, let's look at the union of those. And now, of course, everything works even better because now we have both these contacts and these contacts, but we remain with this bunch of contacts, of course, everything here is symmetric. And actually, it took us a few days and then we realized that the crystal structure that was a monomer, actually, the unit cell is a dimer. And uh, this dimer has this conformation. So here in blue is one copy of HSP70, in red is the other copy. And the contacts between the two copies are exactly this prediction. And it's interesting because this dimer was considered an artifact of the crystal by the, the two groups who resolved the crystal. Now, there has been a little a subsequent work which shown that by weakening these interactions, indeed the performance of the function of HSP70 is decreased. But no follow-up, so we don't know actually what the purpose of this dimer is. But what we can claim is that it is evolutionary preserved. So evolution knows about this dimer. And if it was not functional, evolution wouldn't have cared, but it is. So, and actually there are derivatives that were of this object of this dimer, which is instead functional. So there is pretty clearly the fact that evolution is, was telling us more than uh, what people knew about the crystal. So that was, I think, a first kind of interesting success story. Now, the second, uh, piece that I would like to tell you about uh, uh, HSP70 uh, is about the J-domain proteins that come into play here in this step where HSP70 is going to bind the substrate. Actually, this is, there is this JDP, stands for J-domain protein, which is a mandatory part of the cycle of HSP70 because thanks to it, HSP70 is capable to, of selecting the correct substrate. Without it, it is not. And without it, it cannot even hydrolyze ATP. So it's a really an obligatory interaction. Now, can we say something about interactions? Uh, actually, many groups have tried to crystallize the structure without success because it's a very weak and volatile interaction. Uh, let me just say that this J domain is ubiquitous, is always the same, although it can be attached to many different proteins. So, Many different proteins in our protein, for example, have a J domain so that they will recruit HSP70. And the global function of the pathway, if you want, of course, not of the protein, but will be determined by the other domains. The J domain has just as a role to interact with HSP70, recruit it, and trigger ATK hydrolysis. But what is important is that the J domain changes its structure for each one of these partners, the structure, its sequence. The structure is the same but the sequence changes, again, because of mutations. So there was actually, when we started asking this question, there was a technique that actually uh, developed by two groups. One of them was led by Anne Florence online. Uh, 
uh, which uh, try to do exactly the same game. I adapted this picture from one of the two papers. And the idea is pretty simple. If you know who is going to, which HSP7 is interacting which, which, with which uh, J domain, you can just string the two sequences one after the other, have a joint multiple sequence alignment, look at correlations across the two proteins, and those that are correlated will tell you which, are, which is the surface of interaction. And uh, the problem is knowing who is going to interact with whom. And precisely in those papers, they were clever enough to choose protein sets where essentially the interaction one was mostly one-to-one. -one. But in the case of J-domain proteins, this is not so. So you have way more J-domains than HSP-70s. There is both specificity and promiscuity. So we tried to use their techniques and we didn't get much. So actually Duccio, who is a very uh, creative per person, thought about the poor man strategy. So let's build random pairings in every organism and let's build a multiple sequence alignment, run DCA, run direct coupling analysis and find the strongest uh, couplings. Do it hundreds of times and then just pick, if any, the contacts that pop up the most times. And actually, this is the top of this uh, axis is one, translating 100%. So some of them were always popping up, others were pretty common. So actually, this, this one too was important. And then Alexander, who has a different origin from molecular dynamics, said, well, wait, instead of using directly this context, let's try to do a docking based on force fields, so really uh, on physics, and, and then see whether the two agree. And actually, uh, first of all, astoundingly enough, the two techniques were pointing to a region of the interaction that was already known, although the structure was not known. More or less, people knew where the two molecules should have been interacting. Uh, interacting. The molecular dynamics was giving us uh, two different ways of interaction, but only one of them was compatible with coevolution. So we could choose one of them. And was giving us this picture. In red is the J domain, the rest of it is HSP70. We were pretty happy because everything was consistent what was known with, what, with what was known from experiments at the time. Unfortunately, two months, two or three months later, a group managed to get the crystal. And the crystal is okay -ish in the sense that our J domain here, their J domain is here. It's not that different. I'm sorry for the color code that has changed from the two papers, but essentially it is not that bad. But of course, one is a crystal. Now, since I have been mentioning alpha fold, uh, now alpha fold also does uh, complex predictions. I let you guess which structure alpha fold predicts. This one, not ours. <laughs> alpha fold is very good in what it does. So it's uh, uh, okay. Uh, in a way, if there was not a structure, I think the hours would still be the best prediction in town. Of course, we were just want after three months. That's that, that's life of research as we know it. Um, now, actually, uh, coming back, uh, I think I have still a decent amount of time. I think. So, um, what does the J domain sequence tell us about the full J domain protein? So still uh, thinking about how to explore the sequence space of proteins uh, let's just think about the single j domain the sequence of the j domain which is 63 amino acids and let's ask how much it can tell us about the protein it belongs to because first of all i want to remind you that here we have the j domains and as i said they are attached to many other protein domains that is parts of proteins that have other specific functions. So, for example, here, SEC63 will, will tell to this protein to go at the uh, pore for translocation of proteins from the cytoplasm to the ER. And uh, the, DNA, uh, the J domain there will recruit the endoplasmic reticulum version of HSP70 to help this translocation process. And uh, let's see if I can find it. Uh, here, for example, the NAJB will this DA, this domain will tell the uh, the, NAJ, the J domain protein to go on protein aggregates, where the J domain will recruit HSP70 to dissolve protein aggregates. 
so to a different function. So essentially, it's the gray domain that will decide where to localize the J domain, so to recruit the function of the of the of HSP7. And since we were talking about the increasing number of sequences that we have, here is a log linear plot over time of the number of J domain protein sequences. As you see, it's almost a perfect exponential. And it grows by one order of magnitude every seven, eight years. So you can imagine that by 2030, we will be more than 2 million sequences. Essentially, when I say that there is no problem or bottleneck in statistics in, in data availability, already now we are doing well. For the future, there is no problem. Statistics will not be an issue at all for most proteins. So the question was precisely, can we look at these sequences to ask a very almost provocative question is, is the J domain able to just the same sequence of the J domain able to tell us everything else about the protein it belongs to? Now, this is provocative, uh, first of all, because of course, it sounds almost like telepathy. There is a part of the protein and it should tell us what other parts of the proteins do. Uh, of course, it is not telepathy because we know that everything is connected by interactions, by the local chemistry of the cell. But it's still provocative. And it's provocative in the community also because many people, for many people, uh, many people believe that essentially the J domain would have been interchangeable. You can cut the J domain from one protein and glue it for, for another one or swap them, and nothing would essentially change. So is it true? Of course, if we find a signature that the J, the J domain sequence is telling us a lot about the rest, this might not be true. It means that there is a lot of information about the function in the J domain. So what we did was just to develop stupid neural networks. This is just a mock representation. This is not the neural networks that we had, but they were not never more than two or three layers. So really not completely shallow, but not deep either. And the input of the neural network was just the sequence of the J domain. And in output, we were just asking the question to, to the, we were training the network to tell us something here is in case three outputs, but could be more. For example, is this J domain coming from a selected taxonomic level? So is it a eukaryote or a bacterium? Or is it an animal rather than a plant, rather than a fungus? Or is it a bird rather than a mammal, rather than a reptile? Or cellular localization, is, does it come from mitochondria, from the cytoplasm, rather than from the endoplasmic reticulum? Or functional class, is it uh, devoted to disaggregation rather than translocation? Or is it the domain architecture? Those are domain architecture that we're showing. Is it able to tell us which other domains are comprising the same sequence? So each one of these tasks had its own devoted uh, network. It was not just a single network for all the tasks uh, at the same time. And uh, what is astounding for was was astounding is that in most cases you could reach easily 90 to 95 precision percent precision accuracy in the prediction. In some cases 98. The the worst one was functional localization, where actually we would rely for the ground truth ground truth to on other algorithms that are precise at 90 percent anyway by their their own declaration. So. Uh, the, the core message was, yes, it is possible to tell much about the identity of the rest of the protein just by looking at the J domain, which means that the J domain knows where the protein is, what it does, which other domains are present, and where, which organs it comes from. And so then we say, since we built our networks to be interpretable, easily interpretable, so that we can really estimate how much each position is going to contribute to the discrimination task. Can we find which positions, if there are positions that are over all the classification tasks, always important? So we could take sort of an average of their relevance task by task, and we took the, the top five uh, relevant positions. And then we map them on the structure of the J domain that is here in bluish. And we use this complex with HSP70, since we know that HSP70 is the mandatory partner of the J domain. But of course, we never use HSP70 in this analysis. And so you have that 
In red, here are the amino acids on the, J, on the HSP70 side that touch the J domain. And in blue are these five amino acids, and all of them essentially touch the surface of interaction. So in a way, the most important position to tell the difference from one J domain to the other, and tell the identity of different J domains, are the ones that touch the HSP70. And this is kind of surprising, not, maybe not surprising a, a posteriori, but it just says that as HSP70 has changed during the course of evolution, changing organs, changing compartment, changing and specializing different functions, need, it needs a J domain, so it's, other J domains have to evolve to follow. It cannot do without. And so here we have a sort of a chase, a coevolution seen only from one side, in this case, between HSP70 and the J domain. So also in this case, we could extract information about the structure of the interaction or the relevance of the different part of the interaction, but just by a pure sequence analysis. Now, let me just be provocative and uh, finish my talk with something that we have just started very recently. I forgot to put him in the acknowledgement with Alejandro Lage Castellanos, who is from the University of La Habana in Cuba which is really using AlphaFold as a tool. Now, actually, as I said, the first version of AlphaFold was based on coevolution, or directly on direct coupling analysis. Now, the second version, which is more efficient, it still builds on the same principle, though it does everything algorithmically much better. Uh, and it is so efficient that it, it is able, it was a big discovery, it was able for free to get complexes. They didn't expect to, to be predictive for complexes, but in the end, it was. So they got complexes for free out of their work, uh, and only later on they optimized them. And so we thought about going back to the problem of the interactions between HSP70s and J domains, because as you remember, I said that we have some HSP70, typically way more J domain proteins, so J domains around, and we don't really know who is interacting with whom. Now, E. coli, the model bacterium, is a special case because in this case we know that we have three HSP70s, we have six proteins that contain a G domain, and we know who is going to with, with whom. So this is a special case, but of course this it's already more difficult for Homo sapiens. We have 13 HSP70s and 50 J domains. So all the possible pairs, you should test them experimentally if you want to reconstruct the network of interactions. And Arabidopsis thaliana has like 20 HSP70s, which is the model plant, but has 272 J domains around. So it's clearly experimental, you cannot do it. But there was a paper that just came out a few months ago that was pretty provocative. And they tried, as a game, because what is also fun is that people now are using uh, AlphaFold to play games. Just so, okay, let's say that this is a, a, an oracle that tells the truth. But we know that it doesn't always tell the truth. We know the limitations, but let's say that it might tell the truth. And so let's put to test, uh, let, let's ask questions to AlphaFold. And so what they say is say, okay, we know that we have a protein and two other proteins that could bind to it in the same spot. So either one or the other, not both at the same time. And they knew the strength of the interactions. And they asked AlphaFold, can you always bind the strongest interactor? Or do you do, you do it? You predict the structure, but maybe you are completely oblivious of the strength of the interaction. And it turns out that more likely than not, it was would bind the strongest interactor, so the one with the strongest interaction. And so we say, let's go back then to, uh, uh, to the problem of J domain and HSP70, this open question, who is interacting with whom? At least in the case of E. coli, e. coli where the answer is known. And so we proposed all possible pairs. Uh, here it's a picture that is not yet updated, but we now, we now tested all possible pairings. There are not so many. We have 45 possible pairings. And then we represented them like this. For every pair of J domains, we have an arrow when there is a dual. And the arrow points to the winner of the dual. The dual is binding to the different versions of HSP70. So take HSCA, which is known to bind only to HSCB. HSCB wins all the duals. Take HSCC, which is known to bind only to DJLB and C. 
the, the, the G, A, B, and C win all the duels against the, all the others. And actually, uh, there is also a, a, a ranking, but almost 50-50 between them. So I'd say that's more, more or less equal. And DNA K, which is the most generalist and the one that would bind to three, actually here not, not everything is reported, but indeed DNA J, BJLA, which should be this one, and CBPA win all the duels. And in, on top, we find a sort of a hierarchy between the three of them. So alpha fold, at least in this case, is correct, which was already kind of astounding for us. Uh, now the next step will be to try on more complex organisms, try first where we on interactions that are known to test it, and then uh, try and risk our reputation on something that is unknown. Of course, then you have to understand that alpha fold is a prediction, so it will always be an hypothesis to be tested experimentally. But instead of testing everything, maybe one can go with some more reasonable predictions to be tested in a limited experiment, in a limited number of experiments. And so, but uh, just to say that this so, uh, idea of exploration of uh, the uh, sequence space of proteins through different means, both from the mathematical perspective or really of building models of proteins or playing games with tools that are efficient already at exploring this or exploiting this sequence information, as a, as a bright future uh, is really fun. You can do a lot of things. Uh, actually, as I said, uh, this is my last slide. Uh, you can, uh, people are now trying to generate new sequences of proteins. For example, Alfluorans, who is connected, uh, is doing that in a really amazing way. Uh, and so on. So the, it opens up the possibility to have a better understanding of the proteins uh, of the sequence space. And so, for example, protein design, protein generation, understanding the role of mutations uh, in diseases. Uh, takes a different perspective, uh, complementary to experiments and to the more traditional ones, uh, which are, in my opinion, has uh, a really uh, big, big uh, future. And with this, I stop and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Are there any questions online or on site? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, let me just say some words closing. Of course, many thanks for your great talk, Paolo. It's really interesting. It's, you're, they're not seeing you. I think they should see me like the small, very small to the right. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you a lot for your presentation today. Thank you. Uh, thanks to all who participate on site or online. Just some heads up. Uh, we have a CS colloquium coming up this uh, Wednesday. It's with Professor Pradi Pravikuma from Carnegie Mellon University. And on the 26th of September, same place, same time, we are looking forward to the seminar of Paolo Ricci from Basic Sciences. Thank you. And we hope to see you all soon again for one of our seminars. Goodbye. Thank you.